So for today's video, ASRock wanted me to take a look at the B860 Steel Legend Wi-Fi as well as the Live Mixer Wi-Fi. And I thought I would go out and get myself a Core Ultra 7 265K because a lot of people are telling me this is a good value chip if you're into productivity. And honestly, by just quickly looking, I know people are going to go, oh, Cinebench, Cinebench again. But Cinebench is a good sort of just generic test to run with stressing out all the threads and getting ultimately a score, right? And so in this case, you're getting over 35,000 points with the Core Ultra 7 265K, and it's coming in at a price point that's actually pretty good at 330 ish dollars at this point in time, which makes it so that if you can utilize all those, I think it's 8P cores and 12E cores, if you can utilize them to kingdom come, then you've actually got yourself a decent value CPU. Now, we're going to go, of course, go over the gaming benchmark numbers since gaming is a huge focus here at Tech yes City. It's the main priority, right? Whether it's the used market, it's the new market, gaming comes at the top of the list in terms of priorities because I just love a gaming PC. I love my gaming PC. I love flipping gaming PCs. All things gaming PCs, I love them. And then also talking about the B860 chipset itself, we're going to chuck that in the mix here where we've got two motherboards. And yet again, just like the previous video we did with the B850 from AMD, which I'll put the link up here, which we cover a lot of cool different things there, especially micro differences between FPS. Again, I'm going with the live mixer in terms of the value pick. Even though it's $10 cheaper it's just got a much more i easy friendly bios for me personally so it's more like getting down to aesthetic things here and i also like the simple look of this board i also like the steel legend don't get me wrong if you want a light themed motherboard you're probably going to go bananas over the steel legend it does look really nice and in terms of the live mixer though it's just a simple looking board that also ultimately features just a boatload of USB Type A's at the back of the board, which I personally prefer. I always find myself needing as many Type A's as possible. And so having them there where I don't have to use a USB hub is always a good thing. So you've got that difference at the back where you've got a few more USB Type A's. But in this case with the Steel Legend, you don't actually get an extra Type C. You've both got Thunderbolt 4 ports on both these boards. So that's also another selling point with the Intel B860 over the B850 from AMD is the Thunderbolt 4 connectivity works extremely well. It works really nicely and you can utilize higher speeds as opposed to me using the NX870 motherboard, for instance, from AMD. I did come into some problems with the chipset itself, especially installing an audio interface where I would prefer to use on an AMD platform USB Type-C, USB 3.2. So that's my personal preference on AMD's side. However, with Thunderbolt 4, it just works flawlessly. And say, for instance, connecting an extra monitor off the a hub that you put towards that uh, USB Thunderbolt 4, it's going to work flawlessly too. So great connectivity from that port itself. But then in terms of these boards, you've got both Wi-Fi 6E on board. The uh, Steel Legend Wi-Fi B850 from AMD did feature Wi-Fi 7, however. So if you're desperate for Wi-Fi 7, that's on your list and you want a decent value pick, then that motherboard from AMD is going to uh, feature that. However, let's talk about the Core Ultra 7 a little bit. And then we'll talk about the VRM temperatures here. And honestly, when it came to gaming performance, it was just the best way to describe this is just a mid performer. It's nothing special, but it's no slouch either. Like it's not crazy low numbers. I just was kind of disappointed with the gaming performance. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, for instance, if we look at Marvel Rivals, it's coming in with very similar performance versus, say, a Ryzen 7 7700 even. And then also this continues on to Fortnite, where it's getting very similar performance for, uh, figures too. It's actually underperforming versus a 7700. Then for Baldur's Gate 3, it's also underperforming. And then for Counter-Strike 2, it's falling behind the Ryzen 7 7700 too. However, the 0.1% lows, they're still pretty decent. There's nothing wrong with those. It's going to give out a pretty good gaming experience. It's just that there's going to be much better gaming uh, chips out there that are going to give you not just better value, but better average FPS and 0.1% lows too, which is why I made a dedicated video towards the Ryzen 7 7700. I thought it was probably one of the best value chips out there. Now, one thing I did not happen to get done in today's video was I did test with the same tight timings memory. I, I tried 6,000 megahertz CL26, and I did try to get my 8,000 megahertz uh, 
G-Skill kit working on these boards. However, when I locked in the Expo profiles, it literally just spat out a 6,000 CL30 timings, which in other words, it's gotten to the point now where Intel's underselling that much versus AMD, the Expo profiles on memory is now the dominant profile on the memory itself and there's no XMP backup. So in other words, G-Skill haven't even bothered to implement an XMP profile for these new Core Ultras with the memory that they're shipping because that like people just aren't buying the Core Ultra 7s or the Core Ultra 9s, for instance. So I thought that was really surprising in that aspect alone. I would have loved to have given you guys some 8,000 megahertz memory where I do have, I left my kit in Australia for that real high performance stuff, but the tight timings as well is still going to give out some uh, really good game performance so it's not going to be too much of a difference but that being said i'm sure you're going to be able to extract a bit more performance out of the core ultra 7 if you are into getting better memory as well as even overclocking the chip but if we overclock the core ultra 7 we can also do the pbo tune on the ryzen 7 7700 and then if we keep it to apples to apples the differences are still going to be there in my opinion so the ultra 7 itself not really a gaming chip. If gaming is your main priority, I think there's better value options out there. But if productivity and utilizing cores and threads, especially if you need an absolute workhorse for simulation, then this chip could be a good option. Though before we get into these motherboards themselves, one final thing I will say about the Core Ultra series, the Core Ultra 7, the Core Ultra 9, and possibly even the Core Ultra 5, I haven't tried that CPU yet, is that I would be personally using Process Lasso even though you might think, well, Windows 11's got the scheduler update and whatnot, I actually found one game in particular, uh, Counter-Strike 2, was one running extremely poorly, and then I installed uh, Process Lasso, and the game like basically fixed itself with the bit sum high-performance profile. So if people are having problems with Counter-Strike 2 with these new Core Ultra CPUs, they may, may wish to install Process Lasso, and that could very well help them get back normal FPS. And another crazy thing was I tried some different Core Affinity benchmarks, and this is when I realized the whole Core Affinity layout of the Ultra series is all over the place. Like, just take a look at this Process Lasso illustration here on the screen for you and you'll see what I'm talking about the P cores are like all in different locations uh, instead of just being okay we've got the eight P cores first and the rest are E cores if you've got to tune manual CPU affinity here is where process lasso will actually do a fantastic job of that and it will identify the where the P cores are straight away so you don't have to have any frustrations in identifying which threads to disable if you want to use just the P cores. But the problem I've found with the Ultra series itself is that you actually get lower performance when you disable these E cores. They're actually needed to remain on all the time. So <laughs> there's really no point in just using the P cores, at the very least in Windows, which I would like to uh, give these CPUs a whirl through Linux when I get the time. However, let's get onto these two motherboards here where the chip itself, out of the box, it does consume a bit of power. So we're talking going up to around 230-ish watts out of the box on both motherboards and the VRMs itself on these boards, we do feature a 18 phase on the Steel Legend as well as the 16 phase. So that is the biggest difference between these two boards. You are paying an extra $10 on the B860 Steel Legend Wi-Fi for basically the same feature set. However, you are getting an extra two phases. And that would be the biggest difference I can see between these two boards. However, when it comes down to running this chip at 230 watts, we're just seeing virtually no difference in the performance here of the VRM and the temperatures that we're getting. We saw a maximum of 59 degrees as well as 56 degrees and then 42 on the heatsink uh, with the live mixer. Then on the Steel Legend, we got a maximum of 52 degrees, 40 degrees on the heatsink, and 51 in the software. So basically, you are getting a 7-degree drop there. But again, keeping things under 60 degrees in a 23C ambient environment, there is absolutely zero to worry about, even on the Steel Legend. So for me personally, if I had the Core Ultra 7 II, I'd be fine-tuning it a little bit, trying to drop it under 200 watts anyhow, where the temperatures would drop even more on the VRMs. I think in terms of having two less phases, it's a non-issue because the temperatures are already extremely good. And also in terms of the capacitors, they both got 20K caps, both got the same uh, chokes, and then the MOSFETs, I believe, are 60 amps versus 80 amps. Though, of course, with these motherboards, onboard audio, we've got the Realtek 1220 on both of these. Uh, phenomenal audio performance, around minus 90 decibels of crosstalk, virtually inaudible 
uh, you'd have to have Superman hearing to be able to hear the difference there. And the frequency response curve is extremely flat. So really good numbers out of these onboard audio configurations on both these boards. They're basically identical from the testing I did here, as opposed to the B850s, they were slightly different. The last with these motherboards, you got 2.5 gig LAN on board. The BIOS is extremely easy to use, extremely easy to navigate, lock in your XMP profiles, or in this case, our Expo profiles on an Intel motherboard. And this time around, the actual maximum speeds of the P cores are actually lower than that of say the 14900K, which is why if you wanna go with Intel right now, this is gonna be a weird recommendation with a B860 motherboard review, I'd actually personally just look at say a 12700K, they're going for like $150 right now and you're still getting those eight P cores, which are still very capable for gaming. And you've got some E cores there if you wanna leave them on or off, if you're doing some light background processing. So actually a really good deal in that sense. But here's where with the motherboards itself, Intel this time around, the biggest difference with B860 versus say a previous B series lineup from Intel is that you've got full unlocked memory overclocking but you still got a locked CPU. And so it's just one thing that Intel needs to let go completely of that train of thought and stop doing this whole K and, and making overclocking limited to a K series CPU on top of that, but also making overclocking limited to a Z series motherboard. I think they just need to let that go where AMD on that front has the feature set advantage, right? You can overclock on a B series motherboard and then a non X CPU. It's just that the X CPU is clocked higher out of the box. And of course, people are still gonna go pay the extra money if they just don't wanna bother with any tuning and getting those extra CPU clock speeds. I mean, if anything, I just, the feature set itself from Intel, they're already playing catch up to AMD in terms of gaming performance. But with the motherboard features, they should be going above and beyond too and saying, all right, everything's unlocked now. CPU's unlocked. Uh, motherboard features on a B series is unlocked. You guys are going to get better value on this sort of side of the fence. But instead, it's just the memory. And so they seem to be slowly playing this catch up where they need to just in one big sweep, change the whole bill all together and just say, nope, we're going all in. Forget about the K models only being overclocking. We're going to have a an Ultra 7, for instance, 260, and that's gonna feature overclocking as well. Bringing back sort of the Nalum days where you had the i7-920, and uh, I mean, X58 was the only motherboard choice on that lineup, right? But still, you didn't have to go out and buy a i7-960K or whatever the flagship model was to get overclocking. You got that on the i7-920. So like Intel, you need to sort of go back to the drawing board here in just that sense alone, and really just say, okay, we're going to differentiate ourselves from AMD and offer better value, which AMD was doing when they were playing catch up to you guys years ago. And so I'd like to see Intel really change that around and do something with that feature set from the motherboards. But also when it comes to the CPUs, let's get an X3D competitor here with extra gaming cash on board and see what you guys can really do. You've got to really come out punching hard because a lot of gamers are enthusiasts and a lot of people who do work on computers, especially me personally, I know everyone that I know that does like video production or professional work on computers, they're actually avid PC gamers too. They like to spend a bit of their free time playing video games. So that's sort of like that hybrid market there is actually not as niche as people may think it is. So having a production PC that can also game really well is actually a pretty solid thing. It just, for me personally, it does come down to a lot of nuances. Uh, for me personally, for instance, as a video editing PC, I actually need very uh, low latency. I want a very responsive CPU. And then I go for that, usually that really responsive CPU just so happens to have really good gaming performance too. Anyhow, that being said, guys, the B860 lineup, it's got the good stuff. It's got the bad stuff involved. Uh, me personally, I like the live mixer. A decent value at 190 bucks. Thunderbolt 4 is a good bonus there. However, with the Ultra lineup, it's not the best gaming performance. But as always, it's always a matter of price. And the productivity for the money is definitely going to be pretty good on the Ultra 7 in particular. So if you want a good motherboard to couple with it and you can overclock the memory, you don't mind so much about overclocking the cores, which let's be honest, you're not going to get a whole lot extra out of. At least when I overclocked my Core Ultra 9, I really wasn't able to extract anything out of that CPU. 
you're actually going to save quite a bit of money going with a B860 motherboard. Anyhow, guys, with all that aside, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. Also, let us know in the comments section below what you think of both the Core Ultra 7 265K as well as the B860 lineup here. I think Azrock has done a pretty good job in uh, designing the boards themselves. Everything's worked pretty much flawlessly except for the need for processed lasso, I feel, on the Ultra series. But that's probably more due to the fact that I'm using... Windows 11 LTSC IoT as opposed to using uh, Windows 11 Pro or Windows uh, 10 Pro, for instance. But going forward, I am going to be using LTSC because I just really can't stand the bloat on those mainstream Windows versions anyhow. Though so I'll put a link up to Windows 11 LTSC if you want to check that video out too. Really recommend you guys get off the mainstream Windows after using the LTSC versions. They're very cut down definitely what enthusiasts want. And with that said, hope you enjoyed today's video and I'll catch you on another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.